Good morning. I want to welcome you to Williams Creek Baptist Church this morning. What a blessing it is to gather on this Lord's Day, again, to engage His Holy Word. And His Word instructs us as His people into th- the things of life, eternal life. That guides us as the church. Uh, the Word of God is the foundation of the church. And as we will find out here in our text this morning, uh, we're coming to a church uh, where there is no commendation, as we have seen. There's nothing that Jesus is commending this church for because uh, this church, though they think they're alive, they're dead. John Bloom introduces us to the church of Sardis when he writes, the Christians in Sardis had the reputation of being alive, but they were not, Revelation 3.1. Their reputation was a phantom of, former, of a former real greatness. In the collective historical memory of the people of Asia Minor, Minor Sardis had a lingering reputation for time, a time when they were great. Once it had been the dominant city of the region, the capital of the ancient Lydian kingdom. It had been very wealthy and powerful and influential. But in the centuries preceding John's apocalyptic epistle, Sardis had become repeatedly conquered. Twice it had been invaded at night. The city was caught sleeping. Now, it was a fading beauty, a withered version of what it once had been. Its past reputation exceeded its present reality. So Jesus, in His stinging words, these were chosen carefully as He writes, or as He dictates, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Why did they need this rebuke? Didn't they notice their spiritual decline? Didn't they discern their hypocrisy? Sadly, We can easily be deceived into thinking that if others see us as alive, then perhaps it's true. As a result of the fall, each one of us suffers from a sin-induced disassociative identity and our sin nature. It's rebelliously disassociating our identities as dependent creatures on the one true God. And as we think about how we are dependent upon Jesus Christ, as we see in John 15, He is the vine and we are the branches. And if we're going to have life, we're going to have life in Christ. Jesus Christ, preferring to think of ourselves as instead of belonging to Him and worshiping Him, we think of ourselves as our own creator vines. But having fallen from our identities, from our Creator, we lose our grip on the true reality of who we really are. But in our, into our blinding, impoverishing Sardis and their pride, we see Jesus coming, speaking words that at first sting badly, but in truth and They're they're full of grace. This truth is full of grace. I know your works, He says. He knows. He knows who and what we really are. Before Him, we are fully exposed. And apart from Jesus Christ and His redeeming grace, we are dead. Dead in our trespasses and sins. So what does Jesus have to say to His church today through this church who thinks it's alive, but is actually dead. Well, join with me as we read together from Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. To the angel of the church of Sardis writes, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up 
and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the gift of this word. And what a sobering Staggering reality that we see here in the life or the lifelessness of the church of Sardis. They were very active, very involved, and yet their hearts were far from you. And they were dead spiritually. They had not remembered the gospel that had once been preached to them. Lord, as we think about the state of, of this particular church, we think of many in the world that have walked away from Your Word. They're, they're making it up as they go. They're blaming it on the movement of, of the Holy Spirit directing them to do things that are just completely contrary to Your Word. And we know that the Holy Spirit would never do that. And so, Father God, I pray that You would speak to us in this hour that by the means of Your Holy Spirit that we have great understanding and insight. Lord, if there is any way in which we are declining and falling away in terms of our faith, Father God, we pray that You would bring that to mind and to heart and that, Lord, that there would be repentance. And Lord, if there is one here today that hears this message, they would come to Christ. Maybe for the first time they're hearing the words of life. That by Your Spirit You would awaken them Make them alive together with Christ. We love You, Lord. Thank You for the gift of this Word. Thank You for the warnings and the encouraging words to those who remain faithful and overcome. So Lord, we we come before Your Word to to be counseled today. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And again, here we are, the fifth letter. We find that Jesus is dictating through John to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And this letter is the letter to Christ church in Sardis. And there is no commendation. Typically, we, we see uh, from the introduction, uh, as he is writing his letters to the churches, uh, he immediately addresses uh, them. Uh, to He addresses the letter to the, one of the leaders or the pastor, the shepherd at the church, and then he immediately goes into some commendable things, some things that that he is honoring them with. There there is nothing here that Jesus is doing. He goes straight from the introduction of this letter to his church in Sardis to the condemnation of his church here in Sardis. And finally, he speaks of a few people at the end of the text, that are holding on. They are overcoming. He finds life in them. He finds His life in them. And they are faithful. And so, we have this exhortation of Christ's church in Sardis. And again, this is the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to confront His church, to bring His judgment to bear, beginning with His house. So that we would turn to Him and and continually turn to Him from our sin and seek repentance from our sin and forgiveness. And that we would not continue to to walk in sin, but even where we fall and stumble, that we would turn to Christ. So we begin here with the letter to Christ's church in Sardis. And Sardis, uh, as as we note, is is one of the, the seven churches that is in the territory known as Asia Minor. And John MacArthur, he offers 
a, a, a short description here of this, this city. He says the story, story of Sardis is the story of de- degeneration. 700 years before this letter to Sardis was written, it had been one of the greatest cities in the world. And by the time the letter is written, it had decayed and decayed and decayed. It still has a little bit of importance. Today, it is a pile of ruins near a little village called Sartes. But once it was the glory of the Lydian Empire. Once Croesus, its greatest king, expressed himself with unlimited luxury and wealth. It is the ancient capital of the Lydian kingdom. And this city used to be called Hyde in the early years and came to be known as the city of Sardis. Somewhere around 1,200 years before Christ, it took its place in prominence as the capital of the the Lydian kingdom. The, The city endured many wars, usually victorious because of its geographic location. Eventually, though, the wartime sort of uh, uh, sort of dissipated because of the Pax Romana, that is the Roman peace that was declared under Rome. And it's during that time, it became a city known for wool, uh, working with sheep, and a center for dyeing of wool, and it was a garment center. By the middle of the 6th century B.C., uh, the city attained such a high level of respect that when it when its downfall came at the hands of a little-known enemy, the Greek cities received the news of it with disbelief. Despite an alleged warning against the self-satisfaction by the Greek god whom he consulted, Croesus, the king of Lydia, initiated an attack against Cyrus, king of Persia, but was soundly defeated. Returning to Sardis, to regroup and rebuild his army for another attack, he was pursued quickly by Cyrus, who had laid siege against the city. Croesus felt utterly secure in his powerful, uh, impregnable situation because he was atop this Acropolis, 1,500 feet high, and he foresaw an easy victory over the Persians. After retiring one evening, while the drama was still unfolding, he awakened to discover that the Persians had gained control of the Acropolis by scaling one by one the steep walls. That This happened in 549 B.C. So secure did the Sardinians feel uh, that they had left the city that this means, uh, this means of access was completely unguarded, permitting the climbers to ascend unobserved. It is said that even a child could have defended the city from this kind of attack by watching that one area where the wall could have been scaled, but not so much as one observer had been appointed to watch that side because it was believed inaccessible. But the city was conquered. Now, it was only about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira. It was in the fertile Hermas Valley. It had some famous men who came from there. Thales, the first Greek philosopher. Solon, a very wise legislator. Xerxes, the great general. And even the ever-famous Aesop, who wrote all those fables that we learned in our childhood. So Jesus is writing to the angel, that is the pastor, elder, messenger of the church of Sardis. Uh, we see that over and over again. His, the introduction, uh, it is directed, the, this letter is directed to the pastor, the leader of the church, the elders. And Jesus, once again, is identifying Himself uh, as uh, something, uh, as a description from chapter 1. And, and we see here He identifies Himself as He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We've already noted that Jesus is the one who has the seven spirits. We've already looked at this. He identifies Himself as one who possesses the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is one of of the three in terms of of the Godhead. God the Father, God the, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we've already understood this to identify God the Son with 
the work of God the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, we see in the Gospels that John, Jesus promised His disciples that the Father would send His Holy Spirit to them after He had gone to be with the Father. We see that in John 14, 16, and 17. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may be with you forever. That is, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him, but you know Him because He abides with you and will be with you. Now, of the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus would declare in John chapter 6, verse 63, that it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Uh, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. And so it's, it's a very specific title that Jesus refers to himself here in terms of uh, the recognition of the Spirit who gives life. And Jesus confirms that those who would enter His kingdom must be born again. The, 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 the term is regenerated or made alive. And Jesus answers um, a, 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 a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus who had come to in, inquire with regards to Christ and and, and his certainly being from God because of the, the, the th things that, that he taught and his miraculous signs and wonders, he knew that he was from God. And as, as we see him engaging uh, Nicodemus, he's in, engaging him re with regarding uh, a question about entering the kingdom of God. And he says, truly, truly to, to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3, beginning verse 3, I say to you, unless one is born again, that is made alive, new birth, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how, how can a man be, be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of, of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So everyone, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. They are alive. They are made alive spiritually by the means of the divine intervention of the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus is identifying him uh, with the, the seven. He is the one who is with the Holy Spirit, who is the giver of the Holy Spirit, the promise. He is the promised, the one who is promised by Christ from the Father. And he came. We, we see that in Acts chapter 2 uh, on what is known as the day of Pentecost, uh, the arrival of the Holy Spirit to indwell the, the church. But secondly, he, he, he identifies himself uh, also is, is the one who has the seven stars. And again, we, we recognize the seven stars as the seven angels who are the seven messengers or seven pastors of these churches. And, and he says that, that he possesses, he not only possesses, um, uh, this relationship, ongoing fellowship and work side by side. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God, God sends the Son and the, through the Father, the, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. I mean, uh, their work is um, interconnected with regards to um, that oneness. And so, this is the one that not only pos possesses the, the seven spirits, as the Holy Spirit is described as, uh, but He also identifies Himself as, as the one who holds the seven stars in His hands. Again, these are the seven messengers or the seven letter leaders or the seven uh, pastors of the churches. And, he, and the fact that he holds them in his hands means that these message, messengers belong to Jesus and they are given to the churches to shepherd and teach those who belong to his church. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. So Jesus identifies himself, the Lord, as the one who possesses the fullness of the Spirit and who possesses the pastors, that is the shepherds, the elders, the ministers, the leaders of the church. And Jesus is the one who gives the Holy Spirit to the church, who is the giver of life. 
of new birth. And He has given the Word of life. And He enables us to understand the Word that gives life. God's Word is life-giving. And it's life-changing and life-transformational. We Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We are made alive together through the Word of God by the means of the Holy Spirit, the work of God in Christ. And so He sovereignly leads through pastors who are pastors of those who are faithful, who have been made alive together with Christ by means of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is the one who writes this letter and He is the one who ministers in His church and He ministers through the promised means of the Holy Spirit and through uh, the Spirit-gifted gifts, these, these leadership gifts, shepherds, godly leaders, godly messengers, pastors. And as in all four previous letters, following Christ's introduction, He shares some commendations to each church, but not here. Jesus immediately addresses the fact that they are not a live church. They're dead. They're void of the Holy Spirit. They are starved from a lack of godly teaching from His Word from godly shepherds. They lack desperately in, in both ways, so much so that Jesus identifies their condition as dead. And that's the condemnation of Christ's church in Sardis that we see unfold. And, and once again, here's Jesus knowing. He says, I know your deeds, your works, that you have a name that is a reputation that you are alive. And that word for alive is dadzo, and it, it, it means, uh, you know, in terms of this, spiritual life, experiencing the gift of God's life in Christ. Spirit-filled life. Spirit-giving life. They had a reputation that they were a lively church, an alive church. But Jesus knew that they were actually dead. And He uses um, that, that word in, in the Greek, necros, is the word that we, we get our word necrotic. It means it is dead without life, is lifeless, a corpse. It's, it's, it's something that is decaying. Uh, where we think of the, the word necrotic, dead tissue. Years ago, uh, I knew of a, an unfortunate young man. He was in middle school that had uh, gotten bit by a brown recluse and he had this you know, bite mark up on his arm and it, and it just started to turn black. And, and it turns out as he went to the hospital to get it checked, uh, it, was, it was necrotic tissue. It was dead tissue and it was spreading. And thankfully, uh, they were able to address that and they had to excise all that dead necrotic skin out of, of his arm so that it would uh, stop continuing to spread. This is how Jesus is describing Sardis, the church in Sardis. They are dead. Necros. And so what does dead, what does it characterize? When, when we think of the spiritual realities of, of Christ and His church, uh, the, the, the spiritual reality of deadness is, is that people continue, um, they, they are dead in their trespasses and sin. That's where we have come from, brothers and sisters, in terms of our faith. We were once, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, we were once dead in our trespasses and sin in which we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That, that is the spirit of Satan, not the spirit of God. That is, that's what we used to be. And that's supposedly in, in terms of, of the founding of church and gathered, gathered believers in terms of Sardis. This, this should be identifying, they, they're, what, what Jesus is describing as dead should not be identifying their characteristic now, because if they belong to Christ, they are alive. But the church in Sardis, uh, they were living in the deadness of sin. These people were not redeemed. They were spiritually dead. They were just a gathering of, of unbelievers, of sinners, unsaved unrepentant sinners that were gathering in the name of God. But they were, they were certainly honoring 
God with their lips, but not with their hearts. Their hearts were far from the Lord. So what does it mean to be truly alive? Spiritually. That God makes us alive together with Christ. That's what separates us from the world. From worldliness. From ungodliness and unrighteousness. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. And He raised us up. I mean, raised us up, resurrected us spiritually from deadness in sin to life in Christ with Him. And so MacArthur rightly clarifies that the church, by definition, is to be a place that is identified as alive. It is a place where God lives, where Christ lives, where the Holy Spirit lives, where believers are alive. They've been given life, new life in Christ. New birth by means of the Holy Spirit. Made alive together by God in Christ. And so a church is to be the fellowship of those who possess eternal life. In Him is life, John declares in John's first gospel. In Him is life. And if you're in Christ, you're alive together with Him. The Sardis, they looked like they were alive and fruitful. People looked at them, wow, look at, look at that church. Look at how, how dynamic they are and how vibrant they are and how big they are. But they were not alive. Jesus condemns them because they were dead. They were living in the deadness of sin, far from God's Word, void of the Holy Spirit. It looks very much like um, what Israel, how Jesus describes Israel uh, during his time of earthly ministry, and we see in, in Matthew chapter 21, we see in, in, in verses 18 through 19, this illustration, a real life illustration of a fig tree that, that had leaves and it should have been fruitful. It was in fruitful season, but there was no figs on it. And listen to what Jesus, he, he shares here in Matthew chapter 21, 18 and 19. Now in the morning when he was returning to the city, he became hungry. Seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, No longer shall there ever be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. It was dead. There was no fruit. There, were, there was no um, any example. There was no witness on that tree of life. And it's, it's sobering to remember the context now, Matthew 21, that when this occurs, what happened just prior to this? Well, we find there um, in Matthew 21, it begins with what we know in the Scripture as the triumphant entry of Christ, where countless people hailed the arrival of Jesus as the Son of David, the Blessed One who had come in the name of the Lord, the Prophet, the Messiah, their King, as He was coming in to Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. And they were waving palm branches and declaring Him. And, and some even looked at Him as the King, the, the, the King that they had long been awaited for. And yet, as Jesus arrives at the temple in Jerusalem, He finds people buying and selling, money changers taking advantage of people, gouging prices. And they had made and turned his father's house, he declares, into a den of robbers. When he says it should have been a house of prayer. Well, the chief priests, they were indignant at Jesus and what Jesus had done at that moment. He started cleansing the tables, or the, um, cleansing the temple and, and running the money changers out of there and turning up uh, the tables and the money and animals were scattering everywhere and the chief priests were beside themselves. The children were praising Him as the Son of David even there in the temple, but the chief priests, they, they did not believe that. They, they scoffed at that. They were angry at His treatment there in the temple. 
And so following these realities and in terms of his arrival in Jerusalem and uh, this godlessness that's going on, this this den of robbers that they had made the temple in, uh, the chief priests who who were indignant and could not stand hated and despised would later uh, conspire to put Jesus to death. They did not uh, believe that he was the son of David. They rejected that. It's after this that Jesus comes to this lifeless, fruitless fig tree that illustrates, symbolizes the true condition of His people Israel. They had a reputation as living as God's people, as keeping God's Word. But sadly, they would draw near to God with their words and honor them, honor Him with their lip service. But they remove their hearts far from Him and their reverence from Him consists of tradition learned by just rote. They were just going through the motions. And that's from Isaiah 29, 13. And then that is as much describing the condition of Sardis. No fruit, no spirit, no obedience to the Word, no life. Marcus Lone He writes that the congregation in Sardis was the very reverse of the church in Smyrna. Smyrna was put to death. In other words, they were being martyred. And Jesus promised them that even though you're going to die, you're going to be put to death, you will live. Because they believed. They they went faithfully and martyred Him and did not denounce Christ. They confessed Him to their death. But Sardis? They appear to be alive. And yet Jesus, knowing their hearts, they were dead. So the church of Sardis has been found for the majority of those who were there in the church to be dead, filled with unbelievers. No presence of the Holy Spirit. No presence of godly shepherds. For whatever reason, they were devoid of the Spirit and devoid of Spirit-filled godly teaching. And so the church, he condemns as dead. But in the midst of that, in in the midst of that condemnation, Jesus commands the church in Sardis to wake up. Awaken. And that that word there in in the Greek text, uh, it means uh, to be alert. To be watchful. It's, it's, you know, certainly not an an irony uh, that we can, can look at um, the demise and the downfall of Croesus the king there in Sardis who thought that, that their city, uh, 1500 feet up in the air, uh, on the mountainside was impenetrable. And so they, they saw no need to put a watchman on the tower to see if the enemy was coming. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. That the enemy has taken this church. And he's telling them, awaken, be watchful, be alert. Why why would Jesus tell them to be alert now? Well, because an enemy, he's not telling them to be watchful of the enemy that is coming. Uh, They've already succumbed to the enemy of the world. No, he's telling them to be watchful, be alert for his coming. We see that back in in the Gospels, for instance, Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if you, if the head of the house had known at what time of the night that the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason also you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think He will. That's exactly what Jesus is is telling them here. He's telling them to wake up! Hear what He has to say! I mean, this is God's grace on this church to return to Him. That there would be some in the midst of that body uh, that would turn and repent of their sin, this, this deadness in sin. And he says, strengthen the things uh, which that, that remain, which are, were about to die. And you begin to think about that, you know, strengthen the things that remain. Well, what remains? Well, we'll find at the end of this text 
that there are some faithful that remain. And he is instructing them. And we see how they will, he will instruct them to continue um, to, to be overcomers in Christ. He tells them in verse 2 that I have found your deeds, I have, I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of God. Jesus, he knew their deeds, their works. They may look fruitful to the world. Hey, look at that vibrant happening church. But they are fruitless and dead before Christ. So what deeds, what works is Jesus talking about? Well, at, at the basic level, the, the lowest common denominator is the foundation of the faith itself. We are to be built upon the, the foundation of the apostles' teaching. That is the gospel, the scriptures, the word of Christ. And they were far from that. And Jesus declares in the very same passage of, of Ephesians where He's describing how we were once dead in our trespasses and, and sins and under the, uh, the, the spirits of this evil age, not under the Holy Spirit, that God made us alive together with Christ by the means of His Holy Spirit through new birth. And He set us with Christ in the heavenly places. That's where our citizenship is. And then he declares that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We have been created. We have been given new life, new birth to, to do these good works. That is to uphold the gospel and to proclaim the gospel and to make disciples around the world to go forth and, and to, to live out our faith, to hold fast to the word. If you love me, you will keep my commands. All these things that we find in the scriptures. So what deeds, what works is Jesus talking about? Hey, it, it is, is the, the deeds, the works uh, of the Holy Spirit, the, the spiritual gifts that we have been given, uh, upholding the gospel, holding fast uh, the faith that was once handed down to us from those who have gone before us. And then he says that, you know, he has found that their deeds were incomplete. They were not complete in the sight of my, my God. In the sight of my God, my Father, he says. And what does he mean by that? Well, I think uh, what he means by that, he's speaking to the realities of a judgment that is coming through God for people who do not hold fast the faith in Jesus Christ, but who, who utterly reject Him and deny Him even by their actions, even, even when it looks like they are very religious and godly people. This world is very religious. We do not live in an irreligious world. We live in a, a, a world where people uh, build and, and they develop their own religion and they worship themselves and, and other type of created things. That's what the Scriptures reveal in Romans chapter 1. Uh, they uh, self-identify as, as opposed to deny self and pick up their cross and follow Christ. We see a huge movement in terms uh, of our day that people are, are identifying who they are in this world, even when it, it's... It's totally contrary to the reality of, of who they really are, but Christ knows. You can put on a, a good facade of, of what you want to declare yourself to be, but Jesus Christ knows who you are and who I am. And one day, apart from the intervention of Christ, we're going to face judgment. And Paul says a very similar thing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 with regards uh, to he is not, the, Jesus has not found their deeds completed in the sight of his God, of my God, his Father. Listen to what Paul says in terms of the charge of this shepherd for the Ephesian church that Timothy was uh, a pastor, an elder uh, in those days. And he says in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God, and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by His appearing in His kingdom. In other words, He's speaking of a judgment to come. What Paul is writing here to Timothy is that we will stand accountable before God and Christ. Apart from the saving work of Christ, we will face God's judgment and wrath for our sins. Therefore, we need to repent of our sins. 
and turn in faith to Jesus Christ. Tom Schreiner further clarifies what Jesus means here. He says, Revelation often proclaims God's judgment against those who sin, who sin, um, fail to repent, who, those who sin and fail to repent. Human beings will face God's fierce wrath unless they turn from their evil ways. Human beings are sinners and they need to be freed from their sins to enter the heavenly city. In other words, to enter the kingdom. Every death does not result and people going to, to heaven. The entrance into the kingdom of Christ, Jesus, he, he tells Nicodemus, you must be born again from above by the Spirit. You must be alive in the Spirit. You, know, you must belong to and confess Christ even to the point of death if that's what it brings it down to. That our freedom to continue in fellowship with God for eternity and to live in His kingdom, uh, to, to, to enter into the presence of God comes from and through the blood of Christ. So therefore, G Jesus calls the church at Sardis to repent. He calls them to remember. Remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. So, so what is it? What are they to remember? What is it that they have received and heard that they must keep? Well, they are to keep the gospel. Paul, he, he, he says, states this countless times throughout his epistles. We see it over and over again. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also receive, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you. That's what he's talking about, uh, repenting. You, know, you, you need to um, remember what you have received. What did we receive in faith? We received Christ. We received the Holy Spirit. We received the Word. We received the Gospel. We believed in these uh, truths of Scripture. And what we have received, we must keep. We must keep. And where we have failed to do so, we must repent. We must repent. And that's what he says. That they are to remember and that they are to, to remember what they receive, which is the gospel, what they've heard, which is this preaching, this teaching of the word of God. And they are to keep it. We are to repent. What is to come of those who refuse to wake up and repent? Therefore, Jesus says in verse 3, therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come. And just, it sounds just like Matthew 24 when Jesus declared that you need to be alert. Wake up. Be alert. Be watchful. Get on that tower and look. I will come like a thief and you will know, will not know at what hour I will come to you. And we, when we think of Jesus coming like a thief, I mean, it, it means that he's coming when you least expected. You did not see it coming. Because He is coming again. And now is the hour of salvation. Now is the time to repent. Schreiner notes the warning of Jesus in every letter to those who refuse to repent. He says the necessity of believers overcoming can only be described as repentance. If believers fail to repent, Jesus will remove the lamp, their lampstand. That is, He will remove them as a church. Remove their church. The sharp sword of judgment uh, will be wielded against those who refuse to repent, Revelation 2.16. And this happens. Jesus says in Revelation 19 that when He comes again, He's coming to wage war, to judge and wage war against those who stand against Him. Who reject Him. Who say, hey, we, we, we spoke in Your name. We said, Lord, Lord. And in Matthew 25, He says, I never knew You. I never knew You. Those who stubbornly persist in sexual sin. And we see a lot of that in, in our day. And it is the grace of God that, that he, he calls all of us to repent of all kinds of sin. And there's all kinds of sexual sin. That we see in the Bible that if we continue to persist in sin of any kind and fail to repent, refuse to repent, 
He says, those who stubbornly persist in sexual sin, any sin, and do not repent will experience distress, even death, eternal death. I mean, eternal separation will not be entering the kingdom. That's Revelation 2, 21 and 23. Jesus will come like a thief and will judge those who resist repentance. Revelation 3, 3. Jesus will come unexpectedly and these will be found not ready or in other words, unsaved and will therefore enter into, uh, will not enter into the kingdom of Christ. Genuine believers, they do not deny Jesus' name. They endure and hold fast what they have received, the word, the gospel, and what they have been taught until the end. And so here we come to the final exhortation of Christ Christ church in Sardis. And there's a remnant. He, He refers to them as few people there. In, in, in verse 4, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. And the word soiled here, it is a word that means to smear or to pollute or to stain. You know, the soiled garments is, is representative of uh, continuing in sin, unsaved, unbelieving, lost. But these believers, th- there, there were these believers who are not stained with the sins that Jesus is addressing here in the church in Sardis. They are alive. He sees an alive, living, faithful remnant in this church. And he says, they, these don't, they, those um, people, they have not soiled their garments. In other words, that their, that their garments, their earthly garments as they were, not not physical clothing, but in terms of your faith. It's describing, you know, when, you, when your, your garments are soiled, uh, it, it means sinful. But those who belong to Christ, they hate the garment polluted by the flesh. It's what Jude chapter 1, verse 20, 23, as, as he writes, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on building up on your most holy faith, building up on your holy faith, the the holy word of God, the gospel, praying in the Holy Spirit, spirit spirit-filled, engaged in uh, the life-giving spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some. Who are these? Some who are doubting. And he says, save others. Snatching them out of the fire. And the, 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 it's, he's referring to the lake of fire, the judgment that is to come, the, the lake of fire that burns eternally, the, the lake of fire that has been um, created for um, you know, the devil and his followers. Snatch them out of the fire. How? By sharing the gospel so that they might come to faith in Christ. And on some have mercy uh, with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Even though we have been saved from our sin, we still struggle with sin, brothers and sisters. We need to hate that sin. We need to hate it. We need to we need to wage war against the sin in our flesh. And many of us we fight daily battles with regards to sin. There's there's none of us on this earth, even as believers, and that we continue in that battle against sin every day. But he says of these people that they will walk with me in white. In other words, they will be dressed in a different way. They will be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. For they are worthy, he says. I just want you to know that those who overcome will be clothed in white garments. We see that in Revelation 3.5 3, 5 there. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. Another washed, cleansed. It means holy and pure. Nothing unholy can come into the presence of God. And you and I, we cannot make ourselves holy. Only Jesus Christ can. Through His sacrifice on the cross. Through the blood, blood that He shed. He makes us holy. 
He makes us righteous. He gives us a righteous standing. He clothes us in His righteousness. Clothes us in white garments, pure and holy, so that we can come in to the presence of God, His Father. So He who overcomes, well, who is it that overcomes? Well, John asked that question in John, 1 John 5.5. 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world? That is, overcomes evil. Who overcomes the sin of the world? Who overcomes um, the one who rules this world? Satan. He, who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's how we become overcomers. So, we see there. In Revelation chapter 6, we see the examples uh, of people that, that are crying out um, to the Lord. And these people are martyrs. And they have been martyred during the tribulation because of their testimony. They did not love their lives more than they loved Christ. And they maintained their testimony. They endured even to the point of martyrdom. And it says there in, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, that when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God, and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And in verse 11, And there was given to each of them a white robe. And God promises as it continues on to vindicate them. But this white robe means that, that they are welcome into the presence of God. They are holy, pure, have been made so by the Lord. And, and how, how have they been made so by the Lord? Those who belong to Christ, they are worthy because they have been purchased by the Lamb who alone is worthy. He makes us worthy, brothers and sisters. We see that in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, that they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, that is, put to death, and, you, and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then He promises them, and as a promise that, that goes back from before the foundation of the world, that He will not erase His their name, that is the one who overcomes, uh, any of these names, the, the overcomers in Christ, He will not erase their name from the Lamb's book of life. And we see that. We, 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 talk, we, we see that the Scriptures reveal much about the book of life, and we'll look at more of this in, in the, the book of Revelation. But we recognize that those who belong to Christ have their names from the foundation of the world written in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. We see that, the evidence of that in, in Revelation 13, 7 and 8 where uh, the Lord is describing those who don't belong to Him. It was, it was also given to Him uh, to make war with the saints as the beast, and to overcome them. And the authority of, over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. In other words, you know, those who belong to Christ and during the time of tribulation, they are going to face great, uh, a great assault, a great war because of their faith in Christ. But there will be many. It says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. That is the beast. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. That means that there are those who will not worship the beast. They will not love their lives more than they love Christ. Because their names are in the Lamb's book of right, life and have been written from the foundation of the world. They belong to Christ and He alone is worthy and He makes us worthy before God because He purchased us with His blood. And then He goes on to say, even more profoundly, that I will confess His name before my Father who and before His angels. It's, it's exactly what Jesus says in, in Matthew 10, 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses Me before men, 
I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. And what does he mean by that? Well, what he means is that he will confess those who belong to him as his own. He's with me. He is mine. He is one of my sheep. He's counted. He will confess our names, brothers and sisters, those who belong to Christ. He will confess us before the Father. Entrance. Um, there's no way. There's no way that we'll enter into the kingdom of heaven, that we will come before um, his Father in heaven apart from coming through Christ. And that's what Jesus declares in, in John's Gospel, chapter 14. I am the way, the truth, life. No man comes to the Father but through me. He speaks the truth. He, he testifies. You and I, if you, if you are an overcomer, if you're a believer in Christ, if you've been made alive together with Christ, all those things describing what it means to be true, truly born again uh, by the Holy Spirit, then He will confess us before His Father's his Father and His Father's angels. His angels. My Father. And before His angels. Therefore, He concludes, just as He does with each letter, He who has an ear, let Him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This letter has been written to Christ's church in Sardis, but it is, it is a letter to us as well, brothers and sisters. Is a letter to all the churches throughout all the ages. And this church has been playing church. This church has been pretending to be a church. This church pretends to confess God and praise and worship God. They are not alive in Christ. They are dead. Jesus indicts them. And He condemns uh, the, the, this church in Sardis. And there is a remnant. There are some who have not soiled their garments with the sin of unbelief and, and the continued persistence in sin. And he exhorts Christ's church, those remaining faithful, to hold fast and over, be overcomers and hold fast uh, the Word, the Gospel that they receive, keeping that Gospel and keeping that Word. And as James Hamilton he writes, when Jesus calls the church in Sardis to remember. Remember then what you received and heard. He is calling them to remember the way they received and heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we've been proclaiming here today. The gospel of Jesus Christ, who was slain for sinners and risen from the dead to accomplish salvation for those who would believe in him. Jesus calls the church in Sardis to remember the gospel, to keep it, to repent. And we must repent, brothers and sisters, from any way that is anti-gospel, that is anti-Christ, any way that, that we continue to per, you know, persevere in sin instead of faith. We must hate our sin and make war on sin. We, we have been redeemed from our sin. We are more than conquerors in Christ who has purchased us from our sin, purchased um, us with His blood. And in this context, in view of the promise to confess them before the Father in Revelation 3.5, and in view of the way that seems to reflect what Jesus says in Matthew 10.32, keeping the Gospel amounts to confessing Jesus before men. Therefore, Jesus calls upon the Christians in Sardis and all Christians throughout um, the ages to repent of their avoidance of confessing Jesus and keeping the gospel. We must hold fast uh, the name of Christ and the word of Christ. Perhaps you're here on this day hearing this message. And you have not openly embraced the gospel of Jesus because you're afraid of what your family will think. Or you're afraid of what it will do to your reputation. Maybe you think that you'll be okay drifting through life loosely associated, loosely connected with the church, avoiding an open confession of the name of Jesus. According to Jesus, 
That is not life. That's death. And if you will not openly confess confess Jesus as Lord, He will not confess you before His Father. The hope for, for us is the same hope that Jesus offered to the church in Sardis. We must remember what we have received and heard. If you have heard the good news that there is a God who is holy and you are sinful and under His judgment, but this holy God has made provision for your sin in the death and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, And even if you are someone who has never heard that before and you're hearing it now, this is the good news. Believe upon the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Live on it. Keep this Gospel. Repent and turn to Christ. Father, we thank You for the gift of Your Word. We thank You for the testimony of John. The witness of John And the letters to Christ's churches, Lord, your churches, these seven churches, and just how instructive they are for us for our day. And I pray for your church in our day. Our church and churches throughout this world. That we would not be categorized or, or declared dead upon arrival. But Lord, that we would be alive in faith, in your word, holding fast your confession that You are the Christ, the Son of God, holding fast Your Word and upholding that Word to this world and calling, Lord, we call upon those who are hearing this message today to turn to You. And that by Your Spirit that You would awaken them to new life. They would be experiencing new births. And that one day we will all be gathered together in Your kingdom It's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And amen.